Good morning, everybody, and welcome to another class from Florida Friendly Landscaping. Um, we're starting a series today with uh, Dr. Lester from the County Extension Office. He is not um, on this particular class. Um, he is actually hosting or moderating another class at this moment, but we're starting a um, series called Beautiful Yards, Come Rain or Shine. So the first of this series is my class entitled Feeling Hot, Hot, Hot. So I don't know if anyone has noticed that it is pretty hot outside, pretty hot and dry. I am Lily Browning. I do work for Hernando County Utilities. I'm for the water department here in Hernando County. I work under water conservation. The program I use to teach water conservation in the landscape is Florida Friendly Landscaping. Um, here is my email, really one of the best ways to try and contact me. And I'll show it again throughout this program. Um, if you have questions that come up, just drop me an email. I usually see the emails you know, pretty quickly and um, we'll answer them during normal working hours. Speaking of Florida friendly landscaping, these are the principles, the nine principles of Florida friendly landscaping. And we're gonna talk a lot today about right plant, right place, watering efficiently, um, fertilizing appropriately, mulch, all of these things are gonna um, work into what to do with our lawns during these hot and at the moment, very dry summers. It's gonna change. You might not feel like it at, um, right now, but the rainy season is coming. It's inching its way here, I promise you it is. But let's get started here. Some, uh, right now, beginning of June, it is very hot already, um, hitting the 90s, and it's very dry. Um, usually when you think of Florida in the summer, you think of it being very hot and very wet. But at least here in Hernando County, the wet part isn't going to come regularly for a couple of weeks. Um, Mid-June is about the time when our rainy season starts in Hernando County. We can see it, and depending on where you are in Hernando County, if you're east, it seems to come a little uh, quicker for you, a little earlier. Um, I can watch it, it like comes from the east and I swear I-75 stops it from getting any further for about a week. And then since I live very far Northwest in Hernando County, um, once it breaks that barrier of I-75, the afternoon rains come and get to Sunshine Grove Road. <laughs> and I do live west of there. Now there is a actual um, geographical feature there, the Brooksville Ridge, that um, for, with topography and weather, it does kind of stop it from you know, getting any further at that point. By about mid-June, and then when the coast becomes involved, <laughs> too, finally, you know, all of, or at least a good part of Florida ends up having our afternoon rains. But in the meantime, we had a very, very, very dry May. I think it's probably one of the driest Mays on record. And I know a few people had maybe a good 15 minute shower in the Spring Hill area, um, Masaryk Town area um, on Monday. I know because my sister was texting me kind of bragging about it. <laughs> of course, I didn't get any. Um, I could see it, I could watch it down there, but it didn't make it up <laughs> to my house. So it gets a little concerning for us when it is so hot and so dry. So I guess I'm here to give you um, pointers what to do um, in the summer in general, but we're gonna be concentrating right now because we live in the here and now on it being so dry and you know what to do with this situation with the promise that, uh, you know, Father's Day, we should be pretty set in having our afternoon rainstorms, which you will be very happy to have, but then, you know, you'll really start feeling humidity. So we'll have 
that to complain about as well. I have an entire uh, video on how to care for your lawn when it's hot and dry. And you can find that on my Facebook page, which I'll give you the link to. You can also find it on Hernando County Government YouTube page. So I'm not going to concentrate a whole lot on lawns in this program because I have an entire program dedicated to just lawns when it's so hot and dry. But let's talk about the landscape in general. And I just got a question about this on um, my inbox in my Facebook. Somebody asking me he wanted to fertilize various uh, landscape plants right now, and should he? Time-wise in, in the summer, sure you can, but with what's going on right now, again, it is so very hot and dry. So your plants are well aware of that, and I'm sure you see them reacting to it. So you don't wanna do anything to a stressed plant that stimulates new growth. That just adds more stress to it. So fertilizing or just routine pruning, which is going to, um, it, you know, it kind of makes it want to grow more. Both of those things do. And that puts a lot of stress on the plant. Right now, until those summer rains get started, your plant is concentrating on um, its roots. It's concentrating on finding some form of moisture. It's concentrating on surviving. Let's not push it to grow more right now. Let's let it concentrate on uh, survival. The other is uh, pest management. So weeds, there's a lot of things I don't want you to do in your yard right now, which is you know sometimes good news for us. Don't, um, <coughs> don't be pruning. I would actually like you to avoid planting new plants at this moment just because you're gonna make it harder on yourself and the plant to keep it watered. Right now, we're just a couple of weeks away from those summer rains. That would be a great time to plant. Let mother nature help you get those established and watered in. What you can do out in your yard is, is weed. I know that's boring. I know that is no fun and it's tedious, but those weeds are competition for the water resources for your plants. So the desirable plants that you have. So you're helping your plants out by getting rid of the competition for the water. And also as they're working on survival, they may be a little more suspect, you know, um, they might have problems <laughs> with um, insects, disease problems. They may be more susceptible to them. So just keep an eye out. And if you think they have the problems, you know, just cut that problem area off. Like where you see this, um, you know, the spider mite issue, cut that little area off. That's not the same as pruning the entire plant and throw it away, you know, in your household trash. You also don't want to, um, you don't want to stress it by putting a lot of chemicals or anything on the plant right now either. So those are the things that you can do right now. Weed, and I mean, I know there's always plenty of weeds out there. And um, scout, weed and scout, that's what I want you to do. Welcome, Sid. The other things, when we irrigate. Now, um, and this is an issue right now, so, and our, because I just told you we had the, one of the driest maize on record, I know I got an email that goes out to the public from the water management district, which, you know, talked about, you know, things are getting pretty low. They're, we're not bad yet. A couple of weeks ago when I, you know, had a meeting in which the district, the water management district was involved, they showed our water levels overall across the state to still be within um, the band of the normal range. It was on the bottom of that band of normal. <laughs> so not far to slip down to below normal, um, you know, amounts of rain, um, lake and river levels, as well as aquifer levels. So 
you know, we're not far from getting dipping below normal. But again, those rains are coming. So that's going to change when those rains come. But right now when we're in, I get a lot of phone calls that people don't quite have, and I shouldn't say a lot of phone calls, but it's not unusual to get these phone calls of people. First of all, I can't change the um, watering ordinance. That's not within my power. But they do call us and would like us, you know, they would like to get a variance so they can water more because it's so dry. And that just kind of shows a total misunderstanding of how the whole system works. Because it's so dry, you're certainly not going to be given permission to water more. <laughs> you know, the, the resource from where we get the water, you know, is shrinking down too. And um, here at Hernando County Utilities, and that's, you know, 70,000 out of, out of the 180,000 um, people in the entire county, um, 70,000 homes are cheating, are pumping so much water that um, we've more than doubled the amount we normally pull from the aquifer. That's not a good thing either. And we may end up, you know, being fined from the water management district if we go over the levels that we are permitted to pull. See, all those things work together. So um, when you're thinking of irrigating at you know, times like this, you need to really pare down uh, what's important to you. What areas do you want to keep concentrating on? Probably the front of the house, where, so you have some good curb appeal. So, and you might want to let some of the other plants out there kind of uh, try and make it on their own. A lot of your established landscape plants, they are actually gonna be fine, but you may have to pare down, you know, where you have some pretty annuals or something that you really want to look like. Nice, that's your priority area for hand watering, uh, micro irrigation, something like that. So these are your watering days if you live in Hernando County. Citrus County um, just went to one day a week watering as well. Um, this applies to everyone in Hernando County. That's really the only question you need to ask yourself. Do I live in Hernando County? If that answer is yes, then these watering restrictions do apply to you. Even if you have a private well for your whole household or a separate well for your irrigation. And people tend to get very upset about that. Again, kind of not comprehending that we are all taking water from the same place. We're all taking it from the aquifer that is under us. Therefore, that is why all of us are under these watering restrictions. And we break it up by day for several reasons. You know, my day is Monday because my address ends in one. So if everyone whose address ends in one is watering, there is not as much pressure on the aquifer as if everyone just watered willy-nilly whenever they wanted. See, the purpose for this is to try and regulate only a certain amount of people are taking it out at a time. You know, when you're trying to regulate 180,000 people with a certain amount of water, you know, you have to put these these rules in and it, you know, it has to be kind of broad rules so that it works for that amount of people. So, and you are allowed to water before eight or after six. That before eight is the most preferable time um, when we're talking about Florida friendly landscaping. Now these rules are referring to, you know, an automatic irrigation system watering your lawn. That's what these rules pertain to. You're still allowed to water a vegetable garden if you have one. You can water um, landscape plants by hand or with a micro irrigation system as well. They, none of those pertain to this particular. And if you live in a gated community um, such as timber pines, they have still one day a week, but they might have different days because of how their community is built. So you will want to check um, with your 
uh, homeowners association. Also, I am just gonna talk a little bit about irrigation because like I said, I have an entire video on this. So, and I just said early in the morning is really best for your lawn, less wind, less evaporation, less water sitting all night long causing potential fungal problems. And really we are getting a lot of phone calls. Um, you know, one, one gentleman wants to know why he can't water more often but less, you know, less water putting out each time, but more often. First of all, that's really unenforceable when you're trying to manage, again, 180,000 people. Um, you know, how do we know <laughs> how much, we might be able to trust that person, but as a whole, how do we know, you know, that they're measuring just a half an inch twice or a quarter of an inch, you know, four times, something like that. That's just unenforceable. We have to do what, what we can do with the amount of people and the amount of water that we have. So, but for the health of your lawn, that shallow irrigating more often, but with less water is only good for brand new sod and has no roots. It is not good for your sod. I was speaking with someone who told me they water every day their lawn for 15 minutes each sun. And, you know, I was rather upset about that, but um, it's also not doing his lawn any good at all. He is, as my colleague in Pasco County, Jim Moe, often states his lawn is on life support. <laughs> you know, it's a hydroponic lawn. You give it less to give it an inch of water, you will reach down 12, inch, you know, 12 inches into the soil. So, you know, if you give it less than that, you're not reaching down into the soil far, you are creating a shallow root system. To water it the once a week, um, if you have St. Augustine, you know, watering it an inch once a week, you are, um, you are <laughs> encouraging a deeper root system. You're telling your roots, get out and get a job and find <laughs> that water yourself and you'll have a healthier lawn. Now, what people tend to forget when we talk about this and say you need, you know, uh, maybe an inch of water, maybe three quarters of an inch of water. What they tend to forget is that's overall. If nature has provided that for you, you don't need to add to it. What we tend to forget is that our irrigation system supplements natural rain. It was never meant to be the other way around. And I don't wanna get into that too much because that's all in my other video. <laughs> but speaking of rain, you should have a rain sensor, you know, by law on your house. Houses built after 2001 have to come with a rain sensor that is hooked up. Sometimes it's not. And there are various rain sensors out there. There's these um, basic ones um, here. And you can set it for three quarters of an inch, an inch, half inch. And what happens is it rains. There's corks in here that swell up and it sends a message to your system. We're wet enough, don't turn on. This is a uh, soil moisture pump sensor, which is a lot more efficient um, than this one. It actually, you know, you bury it in the soil and it talks to the system to say, we're really dry here, we're wet enough. You know, it, this costs more, but it is coming down in price, but it is way more efficient <laughs> than this one. And you wanna go out and check your irrigation um, system. We have a lot of sand here, and sometimes things get clogged. I'm going to show you a picture of what that looks like on the next slide. Um, just make sure it's operating efficiently. Make sure, especially during these times, that you're not watering your house, your driveway, or the street, because, you know, that's just a big waste of water there. Here's what, and I just got this yesterday from... Um, BJ Jarvis at the Citrus County Extension Office, she put this on Facebook or somebody in Citrus County did, and they took this picture. See now, isn't this interesting? They are 
obviously using their irrigation system, probably at night when they're not looking at what's going on. And as you can see here, since it hasn't been raining, um, it's not blending together. So you can see the only areas that are getting watered are these blobs here. And what's happened is basically the heads, the irrigation heads are blocked by either the turf itself or by sand or something like that. So they're not popping up. So all that's happening is they're just kind of spewing water in these areas and again onto the street <laughs> instead of popping up and you know spraying onto the lawn. So that is just, you can even have an irrigation company come out, which I would recommend you doing, you know, once a year or so. Make sure everything is operating properly. And the only other thing I'm going to say about turf, and I, if you don't remember anything else today from this program, I want you to remember this. You have to mow high. If you want that turf to hold out through these dry times, you have to put that mower as high as it'll go. Four inches is really, you know, the ideal for a floor tan, St. Augustine lawn. And right now, probably not growing much. So don't, you know, mowing is the same as pruning. So let's go back to that pruning thing. It's encouraging new growth, not a good idea. And always, this is an always thing as cutting, you know, mowing high is an always thing as well. <coughs> Keep that blade sharp because then you have a, a healthier plant out there. Each of those blades are cut, they're not torn. When they're torn, that opens the door. Uh, for diseases and other issues. And if you can, I know a lot of you have your HOA after you. And all I can tell you is hold on, hold on, a couple of weeks the rains are gonna come. Um, but if you can put off getting a new lawn, I mean, that's just a big stress to get a new lawn. It's a big stress on your wallet <laughs> to get a new lawn if, rain isn't helping you. So right now we're just a couple weeks away. If you can put it at all, put it off, then get that new lawn put down when the rains are going to come. Now for your bedding plants, again, we're going to leave them alone except for weeding them. But um, mulch, you got to be really careful with mulch. Mulch is a great thing because uh, it hold, helps moisture hold down you know, helps hold soil, moisture in the soil. But right now I would also put off, you know, a couple of weeks, maybe adding new mulch. Well, I didn't ask you to move. Um, because it's gonna be dry, that new mulch from the bag and it's dry out. So when you do try to water it, that mulch might actually steal all that water from your plants. So again, you know, if you had already mulched, only put two or three inches down to try and hold the soil in. But always you wanna pull that mulch away from the trunks of the plant because you don't want the soil, um, you don't want the moisture held up against the plants that could cause fungal issues. But also you want what water that you have to be able to get to the roots of the plants. So mulch is a very good thing if used properly uh, to, Keep, that, um, keep the weeds down somewhat and to keep the moisture in the soil. But adding too much could actually rob the plant of you know, what soil that you do get. So be very careful with that. And it's a good, um, by far the biggest water user in your yard, in your house, on your property <laughs> is your lawn. Um, if you know, if you are watering, if you have a bahia grass or a lot of weeds like I do, um, the bahia, if you happen to have a bahia grass, I know it's crunchy right now, but just wait, just stand out there when the rains come and watch it turn green. It'll be okay. My, uh, my boss, Alice Brockway, she lucky enough to live in that area that got a few, a little bit of rain on Monday. And she said there, you know, the little sprouts are coming back. It turned green right before her eyes. Bahia grass has a way of doing that. Um, but for your 
you, it's a good time to enlarge beds because as I said, lawns, especially St. Augustine floor tan lawns are the most uh, water demanding plants that you have. <coughs> also, probably using more water than you and your family are in the house. So enlarging beds, all I would work on right now is enlarging those beds because I don't want you to plant the new plants yet. Even drought tolerant plants need water, need extra water to be established. So when the rains come, you can start researching now some drought tolerant plants. And when the rains come, put them in. So they're gonna be good and established. And when we have a dry season again um, in the fall, you'll have you know, nice drought tolerant plants. Now, if, if you have just basic um, landscape plants in beds and they're established and let's give them two years to be established, they can survive on natural rainfall. Maybe right now in times like this, you might have to go out there with uh, your rain barrel bucket or with a handheld hose to water it. But overhead sprinklers in, in, you know, that is meant for large areas and for lawns just make no sense in your landscape beds. You want to, if you want a irrigation system in them, in there, please look into micro irrigation. That'd be the best for those landscape plants. As I just mentioned, micro irrigation, but be careful with that. <clears throat> There's not really restrictions on using that. But, you know, micro irrigation, even soaker hoses, things like that, they don't save water. They save water compared to a uh, overall irrigation system, but they use water. <laughs> Saving water would have it all turned off. So they do use water and you need to be careful. Um, don't just leave them on all the time. But then if you're a customer of a municipal water system, you might not be happy with your bill. And your plants won't be happy, you know, being wet all the time. They're not a swamp, you know, most of them aren't swamp plants. But there are retrofit kits <clears throat> you can get to install these on your already existing system. It's very worth looking into. It concentrates on getting water to the roots instead of the overhead, which is very inefficient and not good for your plants. Okay, now I say this with caution about waiting till your plants um, start to wilt before you plant them. Cause a lot of, or before you water them, I'm sorry. Lots of plants right now are wilting. I have beautyberry, which is a native plant and pretty much grows like a weed that's wilting <laughs> because it's just so hot and dry. So even though I tell you azalea, gardenia, hydrangea, hibiscus, and patience, in general, I will tell you they're very um, susceptible to heat stress and they're going to look very pathetic in a hot afternoon. And I call them a little bit of divas and they're trying to convince you to water them when they don't need it yet. Go out there early morning, see what your plants look like early morning. So I'm gonna tell you that about all of your plants right now because some of them may react to that heat stress like this. You don't want to overwater them and cause those kind of issues. But if your plants are looking like this in the morning, you know, your landscape plants, go ahead and water them. You can do that with a handheld hose. You can do that with rain barrel water. They'll love it. Um, or put, you know, the micro irrigation system on for them. So when we're talking about these uh, little guidelines. I want you to remember to follow the watering restrictions. Mow high, there's nothing more important for your lawn, especially during times like this, than mowing high. Don't fertilize or prune anything right now. Don't stimulate that new growth. If you can put off resodding until nature's gonna help you water it in, which is just a couple of weeks. I promise, I, I ordered it for Father's Day. We're gonna have <laughs> some rains. Keep an eye on your irrigation system if you have one, make sure it's running properly. 
what you can get out there and do if you feel like you have to be doing something is get rid of those weeds. That's, that's the best thing to do. And as I said, be patient. This too shall pass. Really, it will. Um, already the weathermen are saying, you know, spots of rain are popping up here and there. He's, you know, the weatherman, I've listened to him saying the rainy season has started. It may have started in spots across the whole state, but before it gets to Hernando County, like I said, I've lived here 43 years, so you can fairly trust me when I say <laughs> mid-June. If it comes earlier, that'll be fantastic, but mid-June before we get our everyday afternoon showers, which are going to help a lot. And for more specifics on a lawn, again, what, go to Hernando County Government YouTube and watch my program on caring for your lawn when it's hot and dry. And there again is my email if you have questions. I'm not done yet though. We're gonna look at some pretty plants that in general beat the heat. And I'll let you know which ones are pretty drought tolerant as well. This is one of them. And we'll get into um, what that is as we go a little further. So let's look at pretty pictures now. Uh, let's talk about some annuals. What's going to grow in our summer heat? Well, these begonias, they you know, might start to wilt too. Um, but again, look at them in the morning. Um, the celosia, the coxcomb, interesting plants there. The coleus, billions of different kinds of coleus that we can have a lot of fun with. Uh, more annuals, Cassandra, uh, this black eye Susan, a nice native. Here's impatience. They're gonna to wanna to be in the shade. And again, be careful, they're one of the divas. They will tell you that life is terrible in the late afternoon. But if you water them, every time they look like that, you're gonna end up overwatering them and killing them. So go out and have a talk with them in the morning. Things always look better in the morning and see if they still need watered then. I guess they're named that for a reason. Flamingo plant is a nice Floridian type of plant, um, probably more like a perennial in a lot of places. Terenia or wishbone flowers there. Um, Angelonia. I'm going kind of quickly because I have a lot of plants, but I'll show my email again at the end. And if you would like a PDF of this uh, particular uh, video program, um, then email me and say, hey, I would like a PDF of, you know, those pretty flowers <laughs> or of uh, feeling hot, hot, hot. And I'll be glad to email that to you. More annuals, different types of shrimp plants and caladiums. I mean, these are just old classics. You know, I think there's some impatience there behind it. Old classics that we're used to seeing, but they withstand the heat pretty well. Now, a lot of all of these plants, when it is so hot and dry, probably are going to need some extra water. Among, like I said, with a hose or having a rain barrel is a great idea this time of year. Zinnias, you know those from up north. Portulaca, I have native here because there are some varieties that are native. In fact, um, primrose is the other name for this. In fact, that is partly what is. Uh, growing in my poor front yard. So obviously, um, you know, they're, they're almost like a succulent. So they're very drought tolerant. Um, I didn't put it there. It's growing as a weed, but I'm not particular. I like my front yard because it's a pollinating attracting front yard. Um, doesn't look like much right now, but some pretty yellow portulaca is trying to grow up there. Um, <clears throat> This I'm showing the native salvia. They're all different types of salvia. Get them established, and they are, you know, pretty good drought tolerant, self seeding. Um, really, should, probably should be in the perennial uh, category as well. And here we have our marigolds. Marigolds do well in our heat. Um, this is melampodium. It has another more common name, which I can't remember, but you know, it, it's, this one spreads quite a bit. So if you have an area that you want it to spread, then it's great. 
This is not Wedelia, don't get it confused with that invasive exotic plant called Melampodium. Um, next, you know, nice happy yellow area there. Morning Glory, there are some <coughs> varieties of Morning, Gloria, Morning Glory <laughs> that are native. I'm showing you these so you know which kind of plants to get in our hot summers um, because I'm telling you now, pansies, petunias, things like that are considered winter annuals here. So you wanna be real careful what you're getting. What you grew up north in the summer is not necessarily what's gonna grow here. We can grow it just at a different time of year. Blue salvia is not a native, but it is, um, you know, blooms very well, attracts a lot of pollinators. Our state uh, wildflower, Coryopsis or tick seed. Um, the seeds resemble ticks. There's nothing about this that attracts ticks, so don't worry about that. Um, and daylilies, I always have a funny story about that because, you know, they're very pretty and there are nurseries that grow lots of different varieties here. One of the bulb plants that we can grow, um, that and amaryllis. Amaryllis is, blooms in the more cool time though. Um, I've had several Northern relatives, you know, when I talk about daylilies and you Northern people will know where I'm going with this. They'll be like, you mean the roadside flower? <laughs> you know, like there's something wrong with it because it happens to grow on the roadsides up north. Lots of beautiful daylilies out there. Now this Gallardia here or uh, blanket flower. Some of you may be noticing I didn't stick a native license plate on it. Poor thing, we'll talk about that in a second. Gazania, absolutely beautiful. And pentas. Um, they hold up really well in the heat and they're your butterfly attractors. Now back to this poor blanket flower, I say it has been Plutoized, just like Pluto was kicked off the planet team. Um, poor blanket flower was kicked off the native plant team. This may be shocking for um, some people. I am in love with bank blanket flower. I've actually gone out and bought more since it was kicked out because I feel sorry for it. If you have it in your native garden, you know, don't freak out. It, it's still a very nice butterfly, insect, you know, pollinator attracting plant. But what they have determined is that it was not here in 1513 when Ponce de Leon came and, you know, European influence with him and more, um, you know, non-native plants were planted. It wasn't here prior to that point. Now there is one ecotype that probably was, but the kind we're used to with the big, bold, beautiful faces and all, they weren't here. So poor thing has been kicked off the native plant team, but it is still a good friend of mine. And shell ginger, you know, very, very nice plant, like some shade as well as this peacock ginger. This peacock ginger, I think even it's pretty small, um, but it makes a nice ground cover substitute for hosta, which we can't grow here. So it's very nice as well. Okay, there's yellow bulbine and there's orange bulbine and they are very drought tolerant because they're very succulent like. Um, everyone seems like has these canna lilies which freeze and come back. Um, you can have them in yellow as well. They hold up very well as does this blackberry lily. And again, you can see the kind of almost succulent like um, foliage, waxy, does very well um, at being drought tolerant. Here's our beautiful African iris. Um, those do more well in uh, more moist of soil, uh, you know, over um, pretty much wet soil. Um, east of our county, more in like the city of Burksville area, probably even the city of Dade City. They um, thrive there. They split them and throw them on their neighbor's porch like people do zucchinis or something. They're a little bit harder to grow the further west you go and the sandier that it gets, but you know, still do okay. 
This is what I said I was going to mention on that first slide with the flowers. This is called beach sunflower. It is a native. It's also called dune sunflower. Really good, easy to care for plant. Grows very well, just think of its name, beach or dune sunflower. I live in a very dry, sandy area of the county. This is the first plant I had success with. Um, it kind of hard to transplant. Um, I've tried over the years and it basically will grow where it feels like growing. Now, if I bought it in pots from a nursery, then it did pretty well, but me trying to take cuttings um, and move it around, I've had limited success. I say limited because sometimes it worked, but not where I told it to, <laughs> but you know, seeds drop and it um, grew elsewhere. The richer you make your soil, the less happy this plant will be. And that's kind of happened in my front bed because over the years of adding mulch or other, you know, the soil just built up so it got all too nice <laughs> for this um, dune sunflower where I have it in this almost uninhabitable area by the garage, it's thriving. And I put it in a pot in the backyard, didn't really want to grow in the pot, it grew beside the pot. So, you know, if you have really, really sandy soil, this is very much worth getting into. It will spread, get to be about a foot tall. I have to cut it off my sidewalk a couple of times a year. Um, and those yellow flowers will bloom all year long until it freezes. And then it will come back after a freeze. Um, or it also gets a little um, unhappy at the end of summer when it has rained so much, it gets like black inside and stuff, uh, but it always recovers. Um, and these yellow flowers about the size of 50 cent pieces. Then we have our beautiful Euchanasia or uh, purple cone flowers, which are native and, you know, make a beautiful wildflower and pollinator garden. Let's talk a little bit about some perennials. Here's our passion vine. Um, I, I'm working on a passion vine again. Again, it likes, um, well, I've seen it grow in pastures by itself where nobody's watering it or doing anything. It was happier for me in, when I lived in the city of Brooksville with the more clay-like soil. I'm working on it out in the sandy areas. Right now, just planted some new that I'm trying to put on my vine, I mean, on my fence. Um, for those who have success with it, sometimes you have too much success with it. It is very aggressive, but it'll freeze back and you can, you can start again. And the, it attracts two different types of butterflies, our Gulf fritillary and our zebra longwing, which is our state butterfly. As far as honeysuckles go, this one I don't think gets the attention that it deserves. It's so much prettier than the, um, Oh, the purple passion vine is native as well. Um, but then our Japanese honeysuckles, this, well, first of all, that's an invasive plant up north, but this native coral honeysuckle, it's beautiful. It has this red color and it's just gorgeous and hummingbirds love it. And it is, you know, just a whole lot better than the Japanese honeysuckle that you're used to from up north. Uh, this per or this um, sunshine mimosa, trying to get it to grow. And what I've learned about it, here, here's a hint. This is a friend of mine. This is her lawn. Um, that is all sunshine mimosa, mimosa strigulosa. Um, when it gets going, it gets, it likes to spread quite a bit. I'm trying to get it to grow in a bed. And what I learned was because it has these runners that attach to the ground, you know, to start spreading that mulch, especially big chunky mulch, which is what I have, the pine nuggets, it's not going to get along with that. So, you know, that's kind of an interesting thing. I'm pulling the mulch away and away and away so it can attach to the actual soil. So if you get this, you know, either get very fine, like composted mulch or something like that. And that was a lesson I had to learn. Horse mint. Um, these are 
Yeah, these are all native and these are gonna start popping up soon in the wild. And sorry about that little fupa there. Um, let's start with some perennials now. This Persian shield, you can put it in a pot and get it going all year. Basically, if you bring it in when it's gonna be really cold. This ornamental sweet potato does fine and spreads actually quite vigorously um, in the heat. And the ornamental pepper. I always wish that the ornamental pepper was a cool season um, plant, but it's not, it's a hot season plant. I want it to be a cool season plant because I think it would look really neat at Christmas, but you know, it's a hot, it's a warm season plant or hot season. Now let's talk about milkweed. There's lots of things to talk about when we're talking about milkweed. Basically, if you have tropical milkweed, Asclepius cursivaca, which is most likely what you're going to find in your big box store when you walk in. Um, now, most of them have said they're no longer doing systemic pesticides for butterfly plants, but you know, check on that. Also, the trouble with um, tropical milkweed, if you have it, I would ask you that from November, through April, you keep it cut back. When it starts to try to come back, keep it cut back. These native, all of the native, which is our 21 in Florida, 21 native milkweed in Florida, they do go back naturally in when it gets colder in the winter. The uh, tropical milkweed does not. And what happens is you confuse the monarchs into staying here longer than they should and not moving further south that um, makes them very susceptible to freezes. Um, also not finding other plants to nectar on as they try to go along their journey um, once they hatch out you know, from the milkweed, from the host plant. Another thing is there is a naturally occurring um, parasite on every single monarch called o OE, I believe. And um, it's just on every monarch always has been, doesn't hurt the butterflies. Enough of it, too much of it is deadly to the caterpillars. So what you have done is um, by having them come to these unnaturally growing uh, milkweed, too many of them in one place. We just learned all about social distancing, haven't we? Well, they're not social distancing and they're spreading this parasite and the caterpillars are dying. So that's not a good thing either. Also, <coughs> I just learned a new thing that, you know, all the milkweed have a certain amount of poison in them. And that actually makes, you know, works for the monarch in that makes them undesirable to eat. Um, but, you know, too much, too much of this non-native around, they may ingest actually too much of that naturally occurring poison, which might, you know, break their threshold and be dangerous to them. So there just is more and more reasons to stay away from this um, cursivaca, uh, Asclepius cursivaca, and has the word curse in it. So therefore I try to remember, I wanna stay away from that one. Here are three fairly commercially available. And I say fairly, cause I don't mean walking into your big box store. You know, you're gonna have to find a native plant nursery most likely. Um, that these three have proven the most, um, they have the most ability to be propagated and um, you know, sold, meaning they, they can be propagated, thrive to be sold and then replanted in your yard. Um, they're working on other varieties, maybe one or two others as well. But these three, the Incarnata and the Perennis, the two surrounding here, they're, you're gonna need a very moist area for those. For those of us with dry areas right now, this tuberosa, also called butterfly weed, is the way to go when it comes to milkweed. And you can look up um, FANN, Florida Association of Native Nurseries, to find native nurseries near you um, and call and find out what type of native milkweed they have available. Here's some herbs that you can do um, when it's hot. Uh, right now is, well, I'll show you that on the next 
one of the next slides when we're talking about edible plants, but basil, um, borage, catnip, some gingers, also uh, majorum, oregano, summer savory. Those are um, some of the herbs that can beat our summer heat. Now, as far as growing vegetables, you know, we, if you're new or come from up north, you just have to learn new timing when it comes to growing vegetables here. Your tomatoes are working on being harvested and being done. Should have started them in March. <laughs> um, it's not the time to start tomatoes. It's gonna be too hot basically for anything except sweet potatoes, okra, and uh, black eyed peas, southern peas. Think about those food items and what do you think about? You think about the South, right? Well, then that all works together. That's what could grow in the summer. So that's how it became known as Southern food. There are other tropical type of vegetables. Dr. Lester is doing, or he did a class on um, like some Cuban pumpkin, calabasa pumpkin. There's new things coming around all the time. So he's the um, edible plant guy. So he's who you wanna keep your eye on to talk to you about more of the tropical edible plants that are coming around that we can grow in our hot, hot summers. Here's some other uh, you know, things that you're gonna see blooming all summer long. They're just starting now. The crepe myrtles are gonna last through beginning of November probably. Um, Crepe myrtles are, you know, they're not native, but they're very uh, attractive, easy to care for, nice plants to have around. Some people say they have absolutely no wildlife value whatsoever. You know, I've seen, I've seen some wildlife on them. Um, it is always better to go native, but then there are these Florida friendly, uh, well-behaved exotics as we tell them. Here's a nice native, the Southern Magnolia. If you have a small yard, this is not the tree for you. You can enjoy it in somebody else's yard. Um, it's gonna get very, very, very tall and very big, but very nice plant. Bottle brush, kind of a classic uh, Florida non-native plant, but it does attract uh, wildlife, um, pollinators, hummingbirds, things like that. You can get a uh, bush version or a weeping version. They usually do pretty well. This is an interesting plant. Um, it was very popular in the early 2000s then kind of waned. Now it's starting to come back again. It's called Yesterday, Today and Tomorrow. And the reason is because of the flowers, which it's blooming quite a bit of the time, start out as this dark purple. They get a little lighter purple, almost kind of pink on the second day and the third day they're white. And of course, you know, they all bloom at different times. So you have three different looking uh, colors on your plant at the same time. That's why it's called yesterday, today and tomorrow. So very nice uh, plant to have, usually pretty easy to take care of and quick growing, quick growing. Here's a nice native, uh, the oak leaf hydrangea. Something about this, I don't know, maybe because it's shade loving and just the way it presents itself reminds me of a rhododendron up north. Um, it's going to give you those white hydrangea blooms, but even when it doesn't, it has these really cool, you know, big hand looking uh, leaves. Very, very nice plant. Flora pedlum or Chinese fringe bush. Very easy to find and makes a nice uh, shrub, you know, around your house. I like it, I think, even better without <laughs> when it's not blooming because this particular variety is called Plum Delight and I love the purple colors of the leaves. Now, oleander, everyone loves their oleander. And I see it a lot on the East Coast. It must be very salt tolerant. But as we always say, if your particular plant has an insect named after it, like this oleander caterpillar, it's very possible that you might expect an attack from this oleander. And here's a picture of um, 
an oleander that I took that was being visited by these oleander caterpillars. It's not all that, you know, terrible of a, of a plant, I mean, of an insect, but it will eat up your oleander. So all I suggest is that you don't put it as a um, display plant, you know, put it somewhere in the corner of the backyard because it might like look like this quite a bit of the time. This caterpillar is gonna turn into this uh, wasp, polka dot wasp moth. It's not a wasp, it does not sting you. It's just shaped like a wasp is all, but it is a moth. So if you don't wanna deal with this, then the easiest thing is not to have an oleander. Then there's this nice uh, firecracker plant that usually fills in spaces very well and is uh, you know, really well, easy to care for. And we're gonna be wrapping up, but um, doesn't feel like it right now, but yesterday was the first day of hurricane season. Dr. Lester on Friday is gonna have a class on um, preparing your trees for hurricanes. So you might wanna to go to Hernando County Extension's uh, Facebook page to find the link for that class. All I, so since he's gonna do that, all I would, all I'm gonna say is a couple of things, which is have an arborist come, not when the storm is out there and you're staring at the TV, have them come ahead of time and um, check out your yard. You know, just let them just see if you have anything dangerous that needs to be taken care of. The other is, uh, you know, don't, don't hurricane prune your palms. If someone comes to your door and says, I want to hurricane prune your, prom, your palms, let me tell you, first of all, that's not a thing. And if it's a, you know, if you think about it, other than queen palm, palms and a few others that we have brought in, our native uh, palms are, they have been withstanding hurricanes a lot longer than we've even been alive, let alone, you know, lived in Florida. So, and if you prune it like these, you are making it more susceptible. It actually needs those fronds for the wind resistance. And I'm sure Dr. Uh, Lester and uh, his guest, Jamie Lynn, are going to cover that fairly exclusively for you. The last thing I want you in to do, and this is the most important thing. And no matter what all we've been talking about and everything, the most important thing out in that garden is you. So I want you to take care of the gardener. <clears throat> it's hot. Don't push yourself out there in the heat. Work in the early morning, wear mosquito repellent. And I'm usually into water conservation, but I want you to put as much water inside of you <laughs> as possible. And follow the shade. When you start in the morning, work in the shade. Move with the shade as it goes across your yard. If you're losing shade, then you're done, you know? I would say 10 o'clock easy. You should pretty much be inside and cooling off and take breaks. You have a swimming pool, jump in it, run inside. Again, get that water in you and wear that sunscreen and a hat out there as well. That sun can be pretty brutal. So again, here is my email. If you would, if you missed part of this program or you're just interested in seeing those plants again and those tips, email me, Lily B, two L's in the middle of Lily at hernandocounty.us and say, please send me a PDF of feeling hot, hot, hot. You can find more of my videos and up some upcoming classes um, at my Facebook page, which is Hernando FFL program on Facebook. Also, Hernando County Government YouTube. You got to put government in there or you might end up somewhere else. Hernando County Government YouTube has a couple dozen probably of my uh, different classes. Now this is being recorded. So um, it's going to be put on Facebook this afternoon and I will send it to um, Hernando County Public Information who will get it ready to be on YouTube within a few days. 
Obviously, he has a little bit of more editing to do now where we had a break there, but that won't take him very long. And YouTube is where the closed caption is. So if you have someone who would like to watch it, um, that is how they can do that. Okay, one thing from the chat from Lee. I have a giant milkweed that's been around for the last 15 years. Do I have to cut them back too? The plants are huge, 10 feet at least, always have caterpillars. I guess it depends on uh, where you live, <laughs> for one thing. And um, if it is that uh, tropical milkweed. So if you are writing Lee from Brevard County, you know, probably not because you are already in South Florida. You just, if you're up here uh, in Central Florida or North, you just don't want to keep attracting these milkweeds. They need that downtime of the winter. They need to be encouraged to go further south, whether that's South Florida, the Keys, Mexico, you know, wherever they're going, they don't need to stay up here for several reasons because they we could have a freeze and they will die in a freeze. Um, or, you know, if you are raising them, then they hatch out in February then they have nothing to nectar on. Broward County, you're probably okay down there. So, you know, Lee, you're okay with that. But for here in Hernando, we don't want to encourage them to be around here in the winter. And um, a Facebook group I was chatting to people with, somebody on there gave me some great words. I always steal words from people, but I just said, you know, if you're raising butterflies, I really like the way that this person presented it, that we should be providing for the butterflies or the pollinators rather than raising. Raising puts in our minds too much control on us where nature has always known what it's doing. And if we just provide the right plants or don't take you know, what's there naturally away, then they're gonna take care of themselves. Um, when we try to step in as good as our intentions may be, we you know, tend to exercise too much control <laughs> and we might mess things up. So I like that providing for rather than you know, raising for the wildlife. So if there aren't any other questions, we're going to stop the recording for now. And, um, we have classes every week, so just look at our Facebook page, as well as that Hernando County Government YouTube. Thank you, everybody.